Have you ever heard of a fake vacation? Anybody, anybody ever heard of a fake vacation before? Um, vacation is kind of a funny form of deception, I think we could say. Um, show the first picture. This is what a fake vacation is. It's when you post a picture on Instagram of you tanning at the beach, but it's actually your fingers. Um, anybody ever done this before? It's okay. It's all right. Anybody? Anybody? All right, show the next one. This is what I'm talking about. Did, did you know? Yeah, I mean, you, know, you start seeing this, you start thinking, well, what can we believe? Uh, show the next one. Look at this guy. Look at He's having a great time. Having a great time. European beach. Oh, wait, never mind. That's just a picture. Uh, show the next one. Look at this person. Look how much fun. I want to say something about this. I hope you're here this morning, and I hope, well, you are here this morning. I hope you have a friend in your life that will hold the trash can as you enjoy your vacation. You know what I'm saying? I'm hoping every single one of you has one of those people in your life. Uh, show this next picture, the last one. Look at this guy enjoying the giraffes. Oh, wait, no, he's not. Have you ever had somebody try to deceive you, but it was obvious? I mean, serious. Let's take this a little more serious. Have you ever had somebody try to deceive you, but it was obvious? This, this uh, next verse, we're, uh, we're continuing our, our study of the book of James. We're in chapter 1. We're going to be in verse 16. And uh, this verse 16, you know what, I almost... I almost skipped over this one. I, I almost just kind of lumped verse 16 right in with verse 17 because it's so short. Um, but then as I was just began preparing the sermon, as I began uh, preparing and praying for it, I started thinking like, you know what, verse 16 is actually a really big piece of this. Uh, before we jump in, there is a sermon guide in your program if you'd like to follow along. It's got the scripture printed out. There's some fill in the blanks. There's some, uh, you know, uh, some places where you can fill in. Uh, some of your thoughts, and they may be helpful for you as you continue processing this week. So with that said, let's jump right into James chapter 1, beginning in verse 16. Here we go. Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. I want you to think of a, of a used car salesman for just a moment. Think of a used car salesman. Now, quick disclaimer. Uh, every used car salesman I've ever dealt with was fantastic. So if you're a pusher of used cars here today, thank you for being here. This isn't about you. I just want us to think about a stereotype for just a second. If a used car salesman tells you that the car that you're looking at is the best car in the world, you're going to take that with a grain of salt, right? 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 Like, like you know that. Like that's, that's not deception. That's, that's them uh, bending the truth or maybe lying or maybe trying to deceive, but it's so obvious, right? We, we know that we're looking at buying this car. Somebody's telling us, hey, this is the best car in the world. There's no problems with it. It's perfect. It'll last forever. This is the best deal in town. You should do it. We know that person is trying to sell us something. It's not deception. Let me tell you what deception is. Deception is believing something is true, but it's not, or believing something's not true, and it is. Now, here's the real problem with deception. If you're deceived, you don't know it. I want you to think about that. If you're deceived, you don't know it. If you knew that you were deceived, you wouldn't be deceived. This is, this is a real danger here. I believe this is why we're all up in arms about fake news. I mean, just, just as, a, as a community, as, as people, I think this is why we're so disturbed by fake news. We understand how dangerous it could be if somebody was being fed bad information and if they were making decisions based upon bad information. That's why it doesn't matter where you are uh, politically or, or where you are and how you think, we're all frustrated and concerned about fake news. It's because we see the danger of people being deceived. I think one of the greatest uh, biblical examples of, of, of deception is Adam and Eve. I want you to think about the story. Uh, there's Eve. Uh, God had only gave, given Adam and Eve one rule. Do not eat the fruit from this one tree. Eve uh, was, was in the garden. It says, it says a Satan in the form of a snake came up to her and said, hey, you should eat this. If you eat this, I, God, said you won't, God said you'll die. You won't die. And not only that, you'll be like God. And, of course, it says Eve was deceived. She, she took it. She did the one thing she was not supposed to do. She ate it. And here's the thing. Satan gave a couple of half-truths here. On the one hand, she did not die. Not immediately. Right? It wasn't she ate it and fell over. Now, it ushered in death. Before that, she wasn't going to die, but she did. And the second thing is that she didn't, she didn't become completely like God, but she did become like God in part. Now she knew of good and evil. 
And this is what deception is like. It, it tells you a half truth or something very close to the truth, but it's actually a, a deception. And this is what James is warning us about here today. James is saying, listen, my, my, my brothers, you're, you're loved. I love you. God loves you. Don't be deceived. Now, in, in last week, we, we talked about the verses right before this. And, and what James is saying, that hey, if you're being tempted to sin, that's not God tempting you. Um, God is not the source of, of the evil and the temptation. Uh, it, it's not. It, Satan is the source of those things. And what James is about to tell us is, hey, listen, the bad stuff that comes from Satan, the good stuff that comes from God. And that's what James is about to tell us. And he's saying, hey, listen, if you're going to get this right, you've got to be sure you're not deceived. Now, I, I, not yet, but I'm about to show you a very disturbing photo. Uh, this photo is, is I, I think, for me, it just captures what it looks like for somebody to be deceived, specifically about God. Um, I, I found this picture on Facebook. Uh, it was a friend of mine posted it um, because they believe it's true. And, and me, me and this guy, I mean, we've, we've known each other ever since elementary school, and we've stayed in touch, and we've gone down very different paths up until this point. Um, but, but he has bought into some stories about God that are simply not true, and, and this is what James is warning us. Now, the picture you're about to see, it, it is disturbing. It's disturbing to me. But let, let me show you what deception full-blown looks like. Go ahead and show it. It's a picture of a young boy holding an IV bag for his mother who's clearly in bad shape. And the meme says... On Judgment Day, I promise I will let God have a chance to explain himself. Now, what's I try to do some background study on this picture. I try to figure out, like, I would just love to know more about this picture. Um, I obviously did not start off as a meme. Uh, this, was, this is a well-known, well-circulated picture. Um, in fact, this has been zoomed in and cropped and edited just a little bit. Uh, the actual picture, it kind of looks like kind of a trash heap. If we zoom out a little bit, uh, we see there's actually a bunch of people look like they're in, they're in really bad shape laying all around. We don't know if it's some sort of natural disaster. We, we don't know the story, but, but here's what I can tell you. That if you're here today and if you're like, hey, you know what, maybe I, I do believe this. There isn't a judgment day, but if there was, it would be God being judged for what he's allowed us to go through. If that, that is what deception looks like, it's where we start ascribing evil things to God and we start ascribing the good things of God to evil. Now, now for most of us here, for anyone who's watching online, anyone who watches the future recording of this, uh, most of us, we're not posting pictures like this. We're not, we're not saying on Judgment Day, I'm going to be the one judging God. We're, we're not there, but I do want to ask you, I want to ask every single one of us, I want to ask you, is there anywhere in your life today where you're saying, hey, that, that thing that is evil, I'm calling it good. Or that thing that is actually good, it's actually from God, I've actually been saying it's evil. Is there, is there anything? I know this is an extreme example, but is there anything in your life that you're pointing to something evil and you're saying, no, that is God, or that is good, or you're pointing to something that truly is good and it is from God, but you're calling it evil. Is there anything in your life? But look what Isaiah has to say. I think it's chapter 5, verse 20. Isaiah says, woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Is there anything in your life right now that God said it, but you're calling it evil? Or, or, or the world says that this thing is good, but God says it's not, and you decided to go with the world and say, no, that thing is good. If you want to grow in your faith today, let me tell you something you can do. You could, you could memorize John 10.10. 10. John 10.10 10 is one of my favorite Bible verses. It is a verse that I have used as a compass in making decisions uh, for, for many years in my life. And here's what John 10.10 10 says. is Jesus speaking. And Jesus says the thief, Satan, comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. Now, I, I believe the most important word in that first sentence is the word only. The thief, Satan, comes only for one purpose. To steal, kill, and destroy. I come, Jesus has come, that we may have life and have it abundantly. Every single one of us, we, we, have, to, we have to decide, like, hey, are, are we, are we going to do it Are we gonna do it God's way or are we not going to do it God's way? Um, if, if you're here today and, and you are, uh, maybe somebody's trying to deceive you or maybe there's an idea that's starting to take root in your life and maybe you're being deceived and in and, and, and the, and the Bible and God teaches us through his word that that thing is evil and yet we're tempted to call it good. Or if the, the world says, hey, this thing is, this, this, this thing, uh, that, that this good thing about God is evil and you're tempted to say, hey, okay, that thing is evil too. Um, I, I want to I show a picture that you'll never forget. It's my favorite meme from all Star Wars. Go ahead and show it. It's a trap. 
Yeah, come on, Sophia, that's what I'm talking about. She ain't even seen the movie, and she likes it. Well, all right, okay, okay. All right. <laughs> it's my favorite. I, I, if, if, any Star Wars fans in the house today? Can you not love this scene where he turns around the little fish character and says, it's a trap. Man, if there's any place in your life where the world says, hey, that part of God is evil, man, it's a trap. And if there's anything in your life and it's saying, hey, this thing is good, but God says it's evil, and who are you going to side with? I'm just telling you, it's just, it's just a trap. Remember, the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. Jesus has come that we may have abundant life. Now, now, how do you know if you're deceived? You don't. How can you find out if you're deceived? I just want to submit to you that the best thing you can do is get really familiar with this book. This is how you find out if you're deceived. And you just, I just encourage you, like, you just read this. And if, if you're a Christ follower or, or you're looking for eternal life this morning, I just encourage you, like, man, just dive into this thing and just ask yourself, hey, this, these, are, these are the words of God. This is a teaching about God. Is there, is there anything in here you disagree with? If there's something in here that you disagree with, I mean, you're taking the bait. You, you, you're, you're being tempted to buy the lie. Is there, is there anything you say? You say, God, I'm, I'm in with you, but I can't, I can't buy that piece. I, I can't buy that chapter. I can't, I can't buy that teaching. That, that seems like an evil thing, God. Why, why would you tell us that? I'm just saying that you've, you've already started the process of deception. Look at verse 17. We deceive because the good stuff comes from God. Here's what verse 17 says. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. The good stuff's from God. That's what James is saying. James is saying, don't be deceived. Like, and all the good things where it says the perfect gifts and every good gift, what he's saying, he's saying everything that comes from God is good, it's good and perfect. And if it, if it rubs you the wrong way, it's like, hey, it's maybe it's because you're being tempted to buy a lie, but this is a good and perfect thing. And, and, and if it comes from God, it is a good and perfect thing. And if you find a good and perfect thing, it comes from God. That's what James is saying. He's saying don't be deceived. Don't buy the lie. These good things, that's, that wasn't Satan trying to make your life better. Good and perfect things come from God. Some advice I, I was given a long, long time ago in my life, it's, it went something like this, and I, I've been applying it ever since, and it served me well. It says that if, if God has taught us something, if God has told us to do something, and you do it, you will always be pleased that you did. You, you'll always be pleased when you do it God's way. You, you'll be left satisfied and grateful that you did it God's way. That doesn't mean it's always easy. It doesn't always mean it, it didn't require sacrifice. Uh, there have been times where I've had to say no to things I want to say yes to, or I've had to say yes to things I want to say no to. But in the end, I, I mean, I've always been satisfied I've done it God's way. Always. And the converse of that's true as well. Anytime that I've done something that God taught against and I did it, let me tell you, it's always left me empty or broken or both. Every time we're... Where, where, where just the world says, hey, do this thing. This is a good thing. And, and the Bible's warned against it. And I do it anyways. Like, I just tell you, it always leaves me empty and broken. Or both. I'm just saying, this is, this is something that's tested true in my life. I mean, I, I know I'm younger than many of you. But, but it's been about 15 years of just living out this principle. No, 20 years. Just that principle has always proven true. When we do it God's way, we get more than expected. And when we do it evil, Satan's way, or when we go against God's teaching, and the thing leaves us empty, it is never as good as it promised. Now what about the second part of this verse? It says, the father of lights with whom there's no variation or shadow due to change. What, what does that mean? Um, I want you to yell. I need your help. I, I need some interaction. I want you to yell out, what's something you enjoy? One, two, three. What is it? Family. Friends. Food. Anything else that starts with an F? Okay, no. <laughs> Friends, family, food, right? Like, there's all these sort of things that we enjoy. Here's what, he, here's, what he, here's, what he, here's what he's saying. He's saying, listen, 
The goodness of God is constant. Think of, think of, think of, a, of, of a picture of a sun and a moon. All right, think of the sun. Uh, no matter where the earth is, no matter how we've rotated or whatever, the sun is always there, and the sun is always shining, right? Like right now, the sun is shining. Uh, Ten hours from now, when it's in the middle of the night, the sun will still be, will still be shining. We just all see it. The moon, however, the moon is constantly changing, right? We're, we're con- every time we look up to the moon, it looks different. It looks different. That, that's, that's what James is getting at. He's saying, he say, look, hey, look to the sun. Look to the, the father of lights where there is no change in them. Look to the Father of Light. There's, there's no change. He's good yesterday. He's good today. He's, he'll always be good. He'll always be good. But not the moon. Like the moon, like, right? You look up to the moon and sometimes it looks different. And there's a lot of things in our life. There's these good things in life that should be enjoyed. They are gifts from God, but they should not be worshipped. Because they change. They may be good for a season, but not good for every time. Let me tell you an example of something that is good, but something that should not be worshipped. Zaxby's chicken. Previously, uh, I'm from Huntsville, but my wife and I, we lived in a different city. They did not have Zaxby's. There was nowhere, no, not in driving distance, no Zaxby's. And I love, with all of my heart, Zaxby's. And so I just always, always wanted, I wanted Zaxby's. I had all these great memories of, of getting Zaxby's. In fact, there's a little sign next to all the cash registers, um, or, or any store near the cash registers, I should say. And it says something like, um, warning, Zaxby's chicken is addictive. Sorry, we're only cl- open for lunch and dinner. And I tell you what, I love Zaxby's chicken so much, I understood the pain of that sign. I thought, I thought to myself, I wish I, could get to, I, could, I wish I could get this for breakfast. But then I moved back to Huntsville, and Zaxby's gets really old really fast, no offense. Like everything, like everything. And I was like, I went to Zaxby's, I kept going to Zaxby's, hey, what do you want to eat tonight? I want to go to Zaxby's, I want Zaxby's. Guys, it's been years since I've been to Zaxby's now. Now, what happened? It, was, it had a sweet season, right? It was a gift from the Lord. It should be enjoyed. There was a season when I loved Zaxby's. But that season has gone. It's gone. I don't know if it will ever come back, but it changes. That's what James is saying. He said, hey, these good things, these good things that we enjoy, man, these are gifts from the Lord. Enjoy them, but they come and they go. They change. Don't put your hope in it. In fact, that's why we call this essential church. Uh, one of the reasons we call this Central Church. Uh, I, I think every single one of us in, in, in our community, I think we're all after the same thing. We want the same things, at least to a degree. I think we're all looking for hope. I think we're looking for peace. I think we're looking for joy. We're looking for meaning. We're looking for truth, if it exists. I submit to you it does. We're, 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 these are the kind of things that we're, that we're looking for. And my friends, if you look for those things, if you look for joy and peace and meaning, if you look for those things, um, if you want those things, it is essential that you find them in Jesus Christ. If you try to find your meaning or your purpose or your joy in your career or in your children or in your hobby or in your unusually good health, let me tell you, those things will eventually let you down. My children, they're incredible. I love you guys. You guys are awesome, but you make horrible gods. If, if you've been blessed with unusually good health, praise God, enjoy it. It's a gift from God. But don't put your hope or your purpose or your meaning in it. It will one day let you down. If you love waking up and going to work every day, praise God. Find your hope in Jesus and the one who never changes. Now, I'm about to share the most embarrassing thing I've ever shared from the stage. Um, I've been preaching to you guys for three or four years now. Three or four years now. There have been some things I said I will never share that from the stage. It's about to happen. I'm just going to ask you to come back next week, please. Uh, I, my wife heard it for the first time last week, and uh, or, for the first time last service. And I, Kristen, please, please, please take me back after the service. Um, this is embarrassing. Uh, here's the embarrassing thing: I fell in love with Jesus and professional wrestling about the same time. Any, any other professional wrestling fans in the house today? Who, who else? I just want to be sure I'm not the only loser here. Uh, okay, good. Thank you. Thank you. I, yeah, lots of losers in the house. Great. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> I'm just kidding. We're not losers. Um, and I was, I was about 15 years old. And, and again, like, like my, my, I really, I, I, was just, I want to be all in with God. I want to be all in with Jesus. And I, gotta, I, I love you. And about the same time I started really getting involved in professional wrestling, and, and one of my favorite wrestlers was Bret Hart. Does, somebody actually knew it from the first service. Does anybody know what Bret Hart's slogan was? 
All right, uh, another one. Title of the hitman. Anybody know the phrase he'd always say? Thank you. I don't care what anybody says, we are not losers, man. <laughs> Bret Hart's slogan was, the best there is, the best there was, the best there ever will be. And here's the embarrassing part that I want to share this morning. I heard that about 20 years ago for the first time, and that was when I started falling in love with Jesus. And to this day, in my mid-30s, almost every single time I begin one of my prayers to God, I begin with, God, you're the best there is, the best there was, and the best there ever will be. I saw you do the forehead slap. It's okay. Please come back next week. It's true. Yeah, it's kind of lame and embarrassing. For 20 years, I've just, just, you know, just in my personal prayer time, I said, God, you are the best there is, you're the best there was, and the best there ever will be. And over those 20 years, I can tell you, there have been ups, there have been lows, there have been bad days, there have been awesome days, and there have been a whole lot of average days. But I can tell you, I can wake up every morning and I say, God, no matter what kind of season I'm in right now, I know that you're the best there is, the best there was, the best there ever will be. You love me, you've always loved me, you will always love me, and I'm so thankful. You bring a level of stability to my life that nothing else provides. Bible teaches the same thing. One of my favorite scenes in the Bible is Revelation chapter 4. It's that John's having a vision. He, he sees heaven. He sees the throne room of God. And it says the angels are around the throne room. And it says they just fall down and they just cry out, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who is, who was, and who is to come. God, you're the best there is. The best there was, the best there ever will be. It is in the nature of God to be unchanging. He is the constant. My friends, your, your housing situation will change. It may get better, it may get worse, it may go through several cycles through your lifetime. Your financial situation, it will change. There may be great seasons, there may be horrible seasons, and there may be many back and forths. Your health, it'll get better, it'll get worse, it'll get better, it'll get worse. It, could, it could do any number of things. My family has changed multiple times. My friends, these, these, these things, when they are good, they're gifts to be enjoyed, but we should not put our hope in them. We should put our hope in Jesus Christ who is unchanging. And my friends, if I, if I could speak to the younger people today, if I could speak to those of you who are my age or who are maybe younger than me, um, I, I just want to say something. I believe that as the world moves faster and faster, the stability of God will become more and more important for your well-being. Things are changing so fast right now, we can't hardly keep up. We are having, here, just put your, I, I just want to speak philosophically for a moment. Things are moving so quickly in culture and with technology that we are having to decide, we are having to decide if we are for something or if we are against something with almost no information and no time to test it. My friends, my friends we're, 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 things are moving so quickly through technology, through politics, through culture. We're having to make these decisions without the opportunity to test it. You need the stability of God. Let me give you a, few, a, couple, a couple of examples. A, few, a couple of years ago, I started a diet. I wanted to lose a little weight, and I did a slow-carb diet. Anybody here ever do the slow-carb or a low-carb diet? Well, let me tell you how you cheat the low-carb diet. And I found this out. Somebody told me, Tim, you can lose all the weight you want by living on nothing but Diet Mountain Dew and beef jerky. So for about six weeks, I lost a tremendous amount of weight. My chest was always tight, but the weight was coming off. Now listen, it seemed like a good idea. <laughs> I don't know, it didn't seem like a good idea. Or coffee. Think about it. Right now, we could look at reliable sources and we could make a strong claim that coffee is pretty close to a superfood and it can actually help your uh, health. We could also look at reliable sources, and we could say that coffee could be the worst thing you're consuming right now. It's adding to your anxiety, it's hurting your sleep patterns, and it could actually be causing cardiovascular damage. Now, we could look at two reliable sources and find contradicting information. My friends, that's, that, what, a, what a time to be alive. Really, we could take any issue 
and we could find supporting and competing issue uh, 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 sources. My, my friends, uh, 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 young people, we are we are the pioneers of what it looks like to be the first generation that has always been on. We're always connected. Thanks to technology, we're, we're always plugged in, we're always connected. We have no idea what the long-term effects are going to be. And honestly, the early signs are not great. We just don't know. Like, things are changing so quickly. We don't, we don't know what the effects are going to be. The fact that we always have a phone with us or that we always have the Internet or we're always plugged in or we're always on. We, we don't know the effects. But I can tell you this. I tell you this. If we become unanchored, if we become unanchored, in the unchanging God, my friends, my, my concern is that we're moving so quickly, we're accepting ideas, and we're doing things that we've not had an opportunity to properly research and properly implement, that my fear is that, that we become unanchored of God, we will be unanchored. Uh, my, my concern is we're just, we're just, we're going to be totally uncentered. We, we don't know what we're going to be for or what we're going to be against. My friends, we need the stability of God. Let's look at the final verse, and we're almost done. Verse 18. Of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Again, another kind of difficult to understand, just on a casual reading. Of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. This is actually beautiful. Uh, there, the, um, most, um, pretty much all scholars agree there's a double meaning here. And, and what James is doing, James is concluding his point that God is good. And he's concluding his point by saying, if you want evidence that God is good, look around. This verse, it has a double meaning. It talks about creation and it talks about recreation. If you, want, if you want evidence of the goodness of God, look around. Look how beautiful this place is created. Look how, look how it's formed perfectly for us. I mean, the creation is amazing. It's beautiful. Turn to the person next to you. Look at the person next to you and just say, wow. Look at them. Wow. 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 That God's a beautiful creator. He doesn't stop there. He's also saying, look, look, at, look at the rebirth. Look at the recreation. The gospel message, the good news of God is that uh, Jesus Christ who created all things, it says that all things are created for him and by him. The, the, the creator, he, he came down, and Jesus, he came down, and he went to the cross, and he died for your sins. This idea that there's nothing that could give you eternal life, nothing could pay the debt of our sins unless Jesus Christ paid it himself. Do, do, do you see the beauty? Not only did God create everything perfectly, not only, not only did God create everything good, but he came down here, and he paid the price with his own blood. I just want you to think objectively for a second. If there was another way for you to be saved, the Father would not have let the Son come. Think about it. If we were pretty good, if we could just use a little bit more teachings, if all we needed was better teaching or some direction, Jesus would have came down, he would have taught us some things, and then he would have beamed back up. Uh -uh. Our sin created such a debt. It created such a wall, such a barrier between us and God that the only thing that would pay for it is the blameless sinless sacrifice and Jesus Christ is the only one who met the bill so James is saying listen do not be deceived the, the bad stuff that, that, that comes from Satan the good stuff it comes from God you need more evidence look look at the creation around us look what Jesus has done for us in John chapter 3 Nicodemus who was a religious leader has a conversation with Jesus and, and Nicodemus is saying, what, what must I do to have eternal life? What must I do to be in God's kingdom? And Jesus says that if you want to be in God's kingdom, you must be born again. And Nicodemus, when he heard this, he probably responded the way that all of us would hear when we first responded. I mean, it's kind of funny, Nicodemus' response, because I, I can see, like, even us today would say the same thing Nicodemus said. Nicodemus said, so Jesus, we're supposed to climb back into our mother's womb and be born a second time? You hear that? You kind of you like this Nicodemus guy, don't you? He's kind of sassy. Jesus said you must be born with water, speaking of birth. Also be born with spirit. Jesus would go on to finish that section, the most well-known verses of the Bible. John 3, 16. For, for God so loved the world, for God so loved you, he sent his only son. 
whoever believes in Jesus should not perish but have eternal life. Jesus tells us that all who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Romans chapter 10, verse 9, a Bible verse says that if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and is Lord of your life, and we believe in our heart that God the Father raised them from the grave, or in other words, that the testimony of Jesus is true, then we will be saved from our sins. And some of us, we need to make that decision today. Some of us were, some, Melody, if I, if I could ask you, could you go back to that one picture of the little boy holding the IV? And if, if, you're, if you're here today and, and this, this is just your position. I just, I just want to ask you, would you reconsider? Would you reconsider? This, this is deception. And Satan would love nothing more for you to think that God is, he's not even there, but if he's there, he's bad or he's mixed. Don't buy the lie. Remember, the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus has come that we may have abundant life. And my testimony and testimony of many of us here is that we have found that abundant life by following Jesus Christ. Anybody here have found the abundant life by finding Jesus Christ? Anybody? Man, join us. Application for, for all of us. Two points of application. Number one, deception. If you're here and you say that you're in, you're in with God, you're, you're in with God, but there's a part of the Bible you refuse to agree with, you refuse to believe my, what I'm asking you is, please, just search to see if it's possible you've been deceived. My request is, would you, would you give it the amount of time it requires this week? Would you find two hours? Would you find two hours and would, would, you, would, you, just, would you just get alone with God? Would you get alone with the Bible and would you just say, God, I, I disagree with this. I, I know that you say it's good. I, I think it's evil. Would, would, you, would you just show me, is there any deception in my life? We, 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 need to, we need to root out the deception. And if you're here, if there's something in the Bible and you're like, God, I like 90% of this book, but I don't like all of it. Would you, would you, just, would you just pray about it this week? Would you, would you fast? If you're a Christian, would you, would you fast for a meal? Give up a meal and just spend that time just praying, God, have, have I bought into a lie? Is somebody trying to sucker me into something? Is this, I, I see what you say, but I just don't like it. I, I think it's evil. Well, I don't think, surely you didn't say that. Would you bring it to God this week? So let's first root out any deception. The second one is gratitude. I think James chapter 1, verse 18, or 16 through 18, I think it's pointing us to the fact that we, we, we need to realize that all the good stuff comes from God. And I think some of us, we feel like we're in a pit this morning. I think some of us are having a bad week. I think some of us are having a bad month or a bad life or whatever. And for some of us, we just need to be reminded of the goodness of God. And I believe the antivenom, the buying, the, the enemy's lies, that God does not love us or he's forgotten about us or he's rejected us. I believe the antivenom towards that is by having a heart of gratitude where we remember all the good and perfect gifts that Christ has given us. So, so if that's you, for all of us actually, no matter where you are, maybe you're having the best week of your life. I want to ask you this week, take 30 minutes. Get alone with the Bible, get alone with the journal and the pen. Just ask you, just be praying, Lord, would you open my mind, would you open my heart to the ways that you've blessed me, to the good gifts you've given me. And I just want to encourage you to start writing those things down. Start writing down those good things. I want you to see just how much healing can happen in your heart, in your mind. For 30 minutes of sincere gratitude for the good gifts that God has given you. Let's pray.